Welcome to our Compose Cast, where we discuss productivity, self hosting, career professionalism, and innovative technology. Here to bring you the latest from the open source ecosystem and beyond is yours truly, Andrew Syriac. And with me is my co host, Jack Moore. How are you doing today, Jack? I'm doing well. I'm excited for today's episode. I think we got a lot to cover. I saw, uh, what do you have up there on for those show notes? I saw quite a bit of information on Scrum Band this week. That's gonna be that's gonna be really really fun to go over, uh, especially having just talked about Kanban uh, and and then Scrum, bringing those together and exploring you know what is Scrum Ban. So I am I'm more than ready I think uh, to talk on that and and go through that information. We do have plenty of articles that I think both of us just kind of came across uh, on the internet this week. Yeah. Uh, my favorite here was this first one, actually. the uh, These people who work from home have a secret. They have two jobs from uh, the Wall Street Journal. I read that article. I thought it was pretty good. I thought it was kind of funny how these people managed to work quite literally two day jobs, just kind of avoiding meetings and I wouldn't say exploiting the system, but just kind of working two jobs at the same time. <laughs> and I mean, they, they say here, many say that they don't work more than 40 hours a week for both jobs combined. Totally. And I think you and I, totally. you and I both know that if, if you take out meetings, right, the actual work uh, that, that needs to get done takes far less than that. Far less than Quicker that. Quicker than discussing uh, it. It, it right. is all the... Yeah, it's it's the management, it's the prioritization, and it's everything around that that takes up the the majority of the time. So I'm sitting here thinking, all right, these guys are probably not people who are high level management. They're not making business level decisions. Uh, they're not obviously invested in any of their companies. They are someone who's just looking for a job. You know, a software code engineer. Code monkeys almost. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. A, a, a code monkey. Uh, a, a, data analyst you know what whatever someone someone whose ability uh to sit down and and do the work is well let's just put it this way someone who can just sit down and do the work at a breakneck speed rather than having to sit back and go through and and go over it right if i if i'm writing java functions if if i'm writing you know if i'm if i'm analyzing excel spreadsheets that's stuff that i can automate i can put my own automation around you know especially if no one else has to use it and it just has to work for me that's really easy for me to whittle away at 40 hours of work down to 10 8 oh easily you know, yeah a, a, a week uh, so so i i don't doubt this the the one thing that did stuck out to me though is exactly what you were talking about going over the meetings and the different ways that people avoid getting caught working you know both yeah. uh, meetings and yeah. and really just the futility of of meetings in general it, it, in your work from home uh, history now that has been almost a year and a half i'm sure uh have you found that you're using cameras for meetings or not, or, or do you have anything mandatory or like what? What do they what recommend do they do them? It? I don't have to use a camera. Yeah. Uh, it's just highly recommended that we do, and then like meetings with my manager, I'll use it. I mean, I can I can tell which my coworkers are gunning for promotions or gunning for different positions, you know, uh, by the ones who use their camera. Like those are those are the ones who about that? who who are working hard, um, and those who don't are just are, are in there to do their job, yeah, right? And, exactly. And that's the thing. I mean, if you're getting the job that you need to get done done, then more power to you. Like that's that's fine. I have I have nothing against it. I mean, I've always said that time is a terrible way to measure productivity, right? That's a that's a terrible way to measure uh, what work actually gets done. So I'm I'm more than happy to see people do this. Uh, obviously, if if you have managers that start to take an interest in these employees and and start you know investing in them, working them up, you know maybe it'd be it'd be hard to bump up their pay grade that much because I mean they're doing two, two jobs, right? Yeah, they're getting paid for two jobs, so it's not like you're you can invest that much in someone um, uh, unless you find someone who, who is worth that. And obviously they've shown that they're being underutilized, right? And overpaid is what it sounded like. Yeah, under underutilized and overpaid. So if you're able to figure out how to, how to motivate someone, one, and two, 
give them give them the sufficient amount of work to do right then you can you can pr- help help the company profit but you start talking about these a lot of these are going to be in the big companies these aren't em- employers with five people in the company no, you know right. these are these are multi thousand people systems where it's really easy just to blend in right if you have so if you have a small business with five or six people you're doing gonna like know. development work you're you you're gonna know right and uh that person has a bigger incentive to to be a bigger part of that company right and and if they're not being a part of that company do they even necessarily deserve to be at that company right do they want to be part of that organization it sounds like no they would rather just be a code monkey and farm out their skills i mean they they might as well go into contract work because they're doing a good job yeah. at it right now um could they could they get more if they they did bill per hour maybe who knows so that's it's interesting to to see how they're how they're juggling this and it will be very interesting to see how they put this on their resume honestly going forward in the future honestly yeah i thought that was uh hilarious they were charging i think the one example out there was the guy that he was present he was teaching a programming class i think on one line and his boss was calling him on the other so this is what he did he said all right students take a 10 minute break and he said he was just getting into the lecture he said he, he students take a 10 minute break I guess he sh- shut down his own laptop, opened up his other one, and took the call. They said it's hard to get caught, right? <laughs> they said uh, you have to be sly, but it's not something that's hard to do. Is kind of what I took away from it. Yeah, and I mean, I have my own personal laptop for my personal things, you know, my desktop, and then I have my work laptop, and and you know that that just that's an easy separation for me to hold, and and I don't doubt other people have done the same, right? Uh, I didn't hear anything in here about like repercussions or anything, but uh, they touched on it a little bit. It sounded like uh, the only thing that the only real repercussion was basically losing your job or, you know, leaking. Sen- if you leak sensitive data, you can be sued. But other than that, they just they can terminate you. That's the worst that happens. You know, you don't leak any data. You're terminated. When they find out your turn. Yeah. But other than that, it didn't sound like any real repercussions. Worst comes to worst, you get fired from one job. I guess you still have the other. True. <laughs> That's all I had for that one. I love that article. I thought it was pretty good. Very entertaining. Uh, I want to dive into this this rational one here. Uh, that's definitely more on the con- more conceptual side of things. So I wanted I wanted to see what what your takeaway from from this was. You know, obviously I have I have my takes on on working two jobs, but you know, is is that a rational option to have two jobs? And how would I find out <laughs> if it's a rational option? All right, so that kind of jumps into the second one here. Why is it so hard to be rational? And really, I know we've been talking about a lot about Kanban. And Scrum, which is kind of, I, I found this article, I read through it. I didn't want to get into the whole, what is rational? What is irrational? What's the logical choice? You know, logical, illogical. Uh, really, I wanted to get in. It was one key paragraph or two key paragraphs that stuck out, and it was about introspection. They kick it off here. Introspection is the key to reality, key to rationality. A rational person must practice what the neuroscientist Stephen Fleming in Know Thyself, The Science of Self-Awareness, calls metacognition or the ability to think about our own thinking, a fragile, beautiful, and frankly bizarre feature of the human mind. Basically, kind of jumps into metaco- metacognition, ba- bas- thinking about your thinking, right? And you have to look at the way you think and understand it and go, okay, was this the right way to think about this problem or the way I'm approaching this? And it kind of made me immediately think of our can board and Kanban situation, kind of how you, you're not going to reduce work but you're going to be able to visualize it and look at it and you're you're constantly working working towards fine crafting a system and the only way you can do that is by essentially breaking it down and i think it's i at that level you're not doing metacognition you're not thinking about the way you're thinking but you're thinking about the way you're breaking down the problem and looking into uh, how your processes work basically you have to be meta about it you can't just live inside the board every day and not look at why the board is the way it is you constantly have to question and look at, all right, well, how can we make this better? What This is how we're doing it now. You know, what's going to what's gonna take it to the next level? So it kind of jumps into that. They get into some other, I'll say, ethical kind of problems that they kind of dive into, which I'm not going to dive into or jump into. Uh, but I really like that one paragraph. I really just like that one paragraph out of the article. And 
overall, the article goes into, you know, what is rationality and kind of the Bayesian approach to it. But I really just like that metacognition bit uh, right in the middle there. I didn't know if you had a take on the article or anything you wanted to add. There's there's plenty I could say. There's a lot there's a lot of information in that article. I I don't necessarily know if I want to bring up split brained uh, science. Um, I don't want to bring up. Uh, I mean, I could I could easily jump into Jungian psychology, right, and and talk about the sure uh, the it and the ego, right? What is self, right? Um, you know, because they have an example here. Uh, metacognition emerges early in life yep. when we are still struggling to meet our movements, m- make our movements match our plans. Quote, why did I do that? Quote, my toddler asked me recently after accidentally knocking his cup off the breakfast table. Uh, and and that I in there is very interesting. You you say, you know, well, what is I? Who is me? Right. <laughs> and, and, and what is the thing that makes me take my actions? And... Is there why 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 does it feel like there's some some meta judgment on the way that I take my actions from myself? Who takes my actions? You're like what you're you're struggling with this this duality here. Um, so so that's another way to to jump into it. I'm I'm just gonna take a very simple approach and say probably the easiest way to do this is expanding the rubber ducky debugging concept to the rest of life i mean if if you're going through a a retrospective right on a on a campaign board right it's i'm not i'm not walking myself through how to split a task and 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 go through it and and um Recomplexitize it and and move it to done. I, I'm not doing that for my own sake, right? I'm I'm doing that for for past Andrew's sake because he knew better than I did, right? He already thought all this out and he said, "All right, I'm I'm gonna let you. I'm I'm gonna make sure that you don't have to think about the big picture every time you walk through this, right? I know I can go back and say I already thought this through." Right. I already know I already explored the possibilities. I already went through everything and said, all right, if I follow this route, this is a way that I can accurately represent reality on the board. You know, the goal that I want to get to, this is going to be the successful way to get to that goal. Um, so, so I do that. And, I, and, and in that, in, in creating that, right, I have to talk through it with myself. And, and that's sure. kind of where rubber ducky debugging comes. You know, you, 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 you grab a rubber ducky and you say, all right, rubber ducky, this is what I'm doing and how I'm doing it. And you're explaining it to someone, but you're the only person in the room. So you want to have something to not look like you're crazy in case someone were to walk in and say, Andrew, why are you talking to yourself? So not not to, to get too far off the track, but the the ability to to almost take a step back, right, and and – uh, contextualize what you're doing and say, all right, I'm doing this for this reason. And if that's the case, then I'm going to have to go about it this way. Right. And, and the easiest way I've found to do that is to have that dialogue between me, myself and I, and, and, and keeping that dialogue open. Right. Yeah. Uh, and, and you could get, you could get religious with this too. You could talk about, you know, Holy spirit, or you could talk about the universe and karma. You, you know, you, there's, there's plenty of ways that people have, have tried to do metacognition. That's just the scientific scientist, uh, sci- scientism way to look at it. Right. It's saying, saying, how do our brains think about thinking? Right. Uh, but, but, but there's a, a lot of ways to look at this. I mean, he calls it right here a fragile, beautiful, and frankly, bizarre future of the human mind. So there's, there's a lot going on here, obviously, that we don't know. But the, the ability to step back and say, is this going to work for us now and in the long run and, and, and put together th- these kind of systems only can happen. If you dialogue with yourself, I believe. I agree. You have to take a step back and evaluate it for yourself. You can't just walk through. This is kind of getting into that, what you said last episode. You can't just walk through life, letting the wind kind of blow you around, right? You have to take a step back, look at it and go, all right, this is where I kind of am. This is what I want to do. Why did I knock that off the table? Oh, my arm knocked it off the table. So 
long article. It was a long article. It, there's a, a lot to lot to break down from it. That was just the kind of one key point I wanted to bring up for this podcast to talk on, especially you know talking about Scrum and Agile. Scrum, I think one of the steps was always. I don't know if it was every sprint. You know, take a look. What were the impediments and what stopped us from getting our number of tasks completed? Basically, so just kind of fell in line with that kind of what we've been talking on. Yeah. Yeah. No, that makes sense. And, and, you know, we, we have to then apply that rationality and say, all right, did one password make that rash, that decision rationally when they decided to make their subscriptions or their service subscription only. And and obviously they, they have reasoning for it. Does it make sense through a, through a certain lens, but you know, here uh, they, they came out with their latest version uh, one password version eight, right? Um, and it is subscription only and won't support local vaults. Now, this is this is a news article that I found through the Linux Unplugged uh, podcast. So if you guys aren't listening to that, for sure, go over to linuxunplugged.com uh, and and subscribe to their not just their podcast, but they have, they've got a whole bunch of other Ton. ones, uh, self-hosted. Um, they also know the guys over 2.5 admins, you know, there's, there's, there's plenty of coder radio, um, great, great quality stuff coming out of there. So, so that's where I came across this, uh, where one password eight will be subscription only and one support local vaults. Uh, so that, that local vaults thing, I think is what I want to, to touch on the most here, because when we're, when we're coming from key pass, you and I, we said, all right, well, we know that there is inherent value in having stuff offline. Like we, oh, we, yeah. we understand Absolutely. that, right? Absolutely. And, and that's why, you know, we have, we're, we're working towards the ability to have our compose work offline as well, right? Have it, have it kind of self-contained. Uh, that's, that's the whole thing about it. It could be almost like a pirate box, what, what have you. So uh, with, with that in mind, right? We look at one password and they say, all right, well, now we, uh, we're not going to do that anymore. You have to question their motivations. I mean, why, why are they doing this? It's not because they can't, right? Maybe it's going to be easier for them to manage, right? Or, or do upgrades or, or what have you. Yeah. I don't know if you, if you caught it, uh, there, there were two things I kind of noticed. It sounds like they're moving to an electron app to kind of connect back to the, I guess, I'll just say server uh, instead of the local the local application. And then the other thing that I kind of was turned on to, I'll just say in the comments here, because uh, I didn't actually go out and find the information, but it sounded like uh, 1Password was using, they said they were driven by data by the decision, but it sounded like to find the web vault, like the uh, offline web vault, that you really had to dig through their site to get to it. So what was happening was that people would get to their site and they couldn't find, you know, you really, if you have to dig for it, you're not going to look. People were signing up for subscriptions as the alternative. And they said it was a data, a data uh, driven decision. So I found both of those very interesting just because of course it's going to be led by data. If you're hiding one version of the application to people of course they're only going to sign up for the subscription service that's all that's that's all that they're going to look for you know most people aren't going to dig for that other option so i found that kind of interesting and then i also found um that they're moving towards oh wait i guess away from i don't know what they were using before but towards that electron app just to communicate back yeah, and there's there's other things that are looking to solve this. I mean, Flutter uh, that the Ubuntu community embraced recently is trying to solve this by being a, a language that works all over the place instead of just a browser sandbox. Yeah. Um, because the less we have to rely on Chrome, the better. Like, I mean, it does its job very well, very well, but it's still, it's very close to being a monopoly and, and that's never great. What are you talking about? I'm running Firefox over here. Well, yeah, I just can't get away from all the functionality that Vivaldi brings, though. I, I really can't. They keep doing a better job at it. I'm like, oh, you guys, stop making me love you so much. So, but but there are other applications. There are other there are other applications other than a web browser. And uh, if you pull down the latest version of the show notes you see that i added one very recently which is a, a link to a tweet i hate doing this 
Yeah, but I couldn't find I, an I image of it out on the web. Um, and and this actually came in uh, DevOps Weekly. I forget. There's there's some uh, subscription uh, mailing list that I'm a part of that had this as their their tweet of the week. And I found it funny uh, because it seems like people are starting to recognize the same problem that we did. Uh, so Alex Cohen writes, congrats on your 2 million seed round. Your small team now only has three months of runway after paying for Zendex, Carta, AWS, Slack, Figma, Zoom, Jira, QuickBooks, Twilio, 1Password, et cetera, et cetera, right? And you look at all these and these are all, guess what? Productivity applications, you know, Zendex, uh, Zendesk ticketing system, right? 1Password, Password Manager, Jira. Another, you know, project management solution, QuickBooks, you know, accounting solution. Yeah. People need these things in order to launch successfully small businesses, right? Uh, you know, and this is something we offer as a subscription service for, you know, less than $50 a month, right? Way less if you go with some of the smaller stuff. Totally. Um, and and it, I, I look at these things and I'm like, yeah, th- th- these it'll corporate- add up. You know, it adds up. It, it'll All those it'll add up. absolutely add up. So, uh, looking at looking at our offering, looks positioned fairly well. You know, uh, against what is what is laid out here. So I I, I see that there is a need uh, out there for stuff like this, uh, and I, and I just want to keep spreading the word around. So I mean, the one of the ways we do that is by doing this podcast, and and really, it's 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 two things. It's it's us. It's us level setting uh, on what we're doing and kind of, kind of getting getting our own thoughts and opinions on current events out there and uh, how we level setting on on how we go through how we approach stuff like Scrum and Kanban and and uh, and and writing our documentation. So I guess it's more than two things; it's like seven different things at the same time. But what, amongst the things that it does uh, is is also an avenue for us to you know s- spread the 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 heads up right that that we have something for this exact problem right yeah that that we are willing to help people who are facing this right now uh, and if you know someone who is facing this or or who's who's had frustration you know in the in the past you know kind of cobbling this stuff together like this this is what we do uh the and the very easiest thing to do is to spread the show Right. And, and to, you know, link to our dot com. Yeah. Right. And just say, hey, check these guys out. Uh, if nothing else, they're willing to have a conversation with you. Uh, and, and, and we are and we are just, you know, sit down uh, over Zoom or Jitsi or Slack or whatever and and just say, hey, what's up? How you doing? You know, what are you yeah. facing right now? And uh, and 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 kind of spend that time to, to see where you're at. I was going to say one of the places we can sit down uh, or we're always available to chat is out on Reddit. That's out kind on of, Reddit, yes. We we're are. out on Reddit, r r compose r slash r compose dot com. R R slash R compose. <laughs> a couple of those are getting <laughs> yes. cut. But <laughs> with the news and community updates, Firefly 3 moving off of Reddit. Just wanted to yeah. segue that right in. So I don't know if you yeah. got to see this. They tweeted they actually tweeted this. They're moving off of Reddit. They said, uh I, I didn't see the reasoning. I think it was because there was a lack of I didn't know if it was lack of engagement. I didn't know what the developer was looking for, but essentially there was a poll he had and he listed about four, he listed four uh, options off and it sounds like they're going to track everything and manage their community now through GitHub, which I found very interesting, just GitHub issues. So I don't know when this move is going to take place or when everything's going down, but it sounds like they're just moving away from Reddit. They didn't like, I don't know if it was the toxicity. I didn't see... The reason for them moving off. Reddit is becoming very political. I mean, he, he just says here, I, I don't really like the direction Reddit is going. Uh, I haven't liked it for a long time. And there's there's a lot uh, on, on Reddit, but I, I, I think mainly there's been over the past year or several years a move towards IPOing, I believe. Uh, and, and so they're trying to clean up uh, this site and they're trying to make it more PC uh, and more tolerable for the broader market where, where that's never been what, what Reddit, Reddit has is. been. It's no. always been no. a, a sub yes. yeah, a group where sub communities yes. can get together and just do their own thing. Yes. Yes. 
and they they have not been as friendly to doing that. So I, I don't necessarily see Firefly 3 being caught up in those particular issues. No. Especially when it comes to political or, or you know, anything. So a, like a personal finance in, app. It sounded like... palatable. Yeah. <laughs> it really sounded like he just didn't want to deal... I don't want to speak for him, and I don't know what he's written, but it sounds like he just didn't want to have the community around it. It sounded like he just wanted to build his app and just build his app. He didn't want that community that, you know, we're trying to build is what it sounded like. It sounded like, you know, when you say you're moving just to get off of Reddit to GitHub issues, it sounds like you're just going to, build, you know, file an issue if you have a problem and I'll fix it when I can. Kind of that, That's kind of the message that he, that kind of, I felt that was relayed, but I don't know if so you. So this, this is very interesting because it comes right on the heels of last thursday uh my mom and i do a a weekly tech talk basically so so give me a call uh over matrix right and, and we'll go through and she'll inevitably have some kind of questions about hey what's this or how do i do that or last time it was you know how do i set up my vpn this way and you know so we're so we're just we're just going through different questions she has about tech because i mean that's that's what i'm here for last week her question was Honey, what is Discord? And really, the only reason that I know about it is because on Twitch, a lot of the communities, when the streamer is not currently streaming, hang out in Discord. And that's a it's a it's a very good way to keep up with the community. It's it's a way to also externalize the community. I mean, Jason's talking about uh, the money's in the list, right? It's it's in keeping in contact with the people, you know, and making sure that they are aware of all the opportunities for them. Uh, and not through one single platform, especially because Twitch, you can really only notify people uh, when you go live. Like the, there is built in email functionality, like you can send out a weekly newsletter to subscribers and stuff like that. But there is no real offline community. Well, and by offline, I mean, you know, other than when someone's streaming, there's no real offline community functionality. And just De fact, the de facto place to go for that is Discord, and and mainly that's because Twitch is a place mainly for gamers, and gamers have used Discord for a long time uh, to hang out and, and stream and co-op and stuff like that. So what I see with that is actually working out very well in that you have the thing, right? And then you have your place for the community around the yeah. thing. So for what I see, moving strictly to github discussions and issues is not going to work because that is where you do the thing that's where you do cold code and pull requests and yada 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 right that means that is that is the main flagship product feature what have you right the community around that where you would gather informally offline needs to be somewhere else or separated somehow like if they made a point to say all right we're going to use discussions on github and then we're going to use issues for the actual pr stuff like that could work theoretically uh, but i would always say that it's it's better to get the people who are most interested in doing the thing on the thing and people who are interested in being a part of the community on the community side because they're going to be users who do not care about the code, but they want to right. be able to to say their user stuff. Like a lot of what we do is is user end stuff. I'm not gonna submit a PR to Firefly Three. I mean, that's just not that's not in my wheelhouse right now. So hopping on GitHub where the code is worked it w- would would feel weird to me because i i I don't necessarily feel that i'm a contributor in that way right i'm a contributor in a more community sense so i would want a place that kind of reflects that Uh, now of course there's always a kind of argument that you don't want things split up Um, you don't want to put a barrier to entry where you have to sign up for two things at once so that's always another one uh, which would be a pro in the you know keep it in one place uh, scenario and and i think you know they 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 have Discord here uh, as a second place uh, option because uh, I'm I'm sure a lot of people are on Discord. Oh yeah, like the Discord Discord over the past two years I think has become what Slack was about five years ago. So, okay, you if you want to have the thing and then the community around the thing, I would say split it up between GitHub and Discord. Uh, if you 
make a concerted effort uh, so that GitHub discussions are not overrun with merge my PR potential. Well, yeah, yeah, potential potential PR spamming, right? Which which maintainers have to deal with because you have a lot of drive-by PRs by people who are just looking to contribute and and you know developers who are on GitHub to simply develop and they don't care about the product really, right. but they they want to feel helpful in some way and they're going to they're going to do a drive-by, right? That's what GitHub is for. And then people who want to uh, have a, you know, help page or, you know, cuz cuz how many times do you see stuff in Stack Overflow or forums or something saying help exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark all caps <laughs> x is broken um and then someone says something about revenue lost and they're using all this business jargon and me as a developer and saying this is not going to get your problem solved any faster you just want to say how important you are that is so funny that you say that uh i'm in a ruby on rails slack and they have an ops chat and of course, someone's application broke on Heroku or whatever. And all you see is, you know, help for, you know, help all caps, explanation point, explanation point, explanation point. They won't answer my support request. This is critical. You know, I need this up online back right now. People are like, yeah, it sounds like a Heroku issue. Do you pay for the 24 seven support? And the guy's like, no. And he, they're like, oh, well, it looks like that's going to be resolved tomorrow. They probably need to rest- restart the dino which is basically the server where your application runs so yeah it's hilarious that you bring that up because you see you you still see it you do still see it but that's not that's not you know a systematic issue and if it is it's not going to be the way that you need to approach right. it i mean right. it, and and actually that's a good way to to break it up if you want to break it up into developers and operations i mean developers are going to be on github operations are going to be on discord right um because operations are directly serving the consumers and consumers are going to consume and you know they they're going to have issues and they're going to they're going to find bugs and 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 you you're going to have bleed over between the two of those obviously but i still think there's value in separating the two i don't know why i would much rather one place just work but for some reason it just doesn't it just works better it just works better yeah i think we're just on a roll here jumping in from subject to subject speaking of developers fixing bugs In patching security fixes, we have Rundeck 3.4.3 here, which has two security fixes in it. It has the, uh, I'm not going to list off the CVEs here, but uh, YAML, deserialization can run untrusted code, which was fixed, and the cross-site request forgery can run untrusted code on the Rundeck server. Both kind of critical. (laughs) So good to see both of those security fixes were updated. And then with core product, there were a couple core product updates uh, that were just part of the 3.4, that 3.4 release. So there were a couple fixes, and really the thing that stuck out to me was the security releases, the security did you fixes. See, did you see on the top left there, they changed their icon to run deck by pager duty? I noticed that I didn't, I wasn't going to say anything. I wasn't going to bring it up. I wasn't going to say anything. That's interesting um, because it's not, you think about it, it's not. Red Hat by IBM, is it? They didn't update that. Correct. So correct. I don't know. Maybe they just felt like they wanted to be needed. I don't know. Well, either way, I think they're taking good stewardship of it, as as you can plainly see here. So hopefully that continues on. Absolutely, one can only hope. I th- and I think they've been doing a great job. So I feel like yeah, I haven't- uh, lately those that that's been one of the projects that's been just full steam ahead. Um, yeah. So there's a lot of exci- there's a lot I'm excited to see coming from Rundeck, um, especially with uh, JSON output and some of the other, uh, I guess I would call it enterprise features. But they features need to that, work on their names, though. Features that wow. we'll see here. Yeah, release three dot four dot three name Papadum Burleywood that camera that seems like it was just generated from a computer. <laughs> but why though? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> That's like a dot. Uh, Kind of similar to, uh, not to get way off track here, you know how you can run a Docker container, it just picks a bunch of random strings, <laughs> puts an underscore between them, and then adds a number at the end? That's kind of like what that did. <laughs> I feel bad if there's a person behind that, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we chose Papa Dumb because... Uh... No, you did <laughs> No, that was no, computer you general. You're a computer then. <laughs> uh, and, okay, 
docker side we do have some of our own developments i would say a pretty big one honestly kind of big one out here we have the portal dashboard ready for you guys so that is looking pretty sweet working on the abstraction layer right now as we speak for a portal to talk back to run deck to do stuff local to get it towards that uh, localized step but that dashboard i'm proud of it it's beautiful it's written in react it's very pretty um the links actually work so when you click on you know the log view it actually highlights the logs in the log view so a ton of cool features uh that we kind of already had implemented uh but just kind of roped together under one dashboard so i think i'm excited to see what comes of it especially with application management through portal uh, right now it's very limited in what you can do with specific applications and adding applications but as we kind of move towards getting this self-hosted solution out there and you know even for our inter our customers uh, that run with our infrastructure just kind of getting that to a state where you know you can add users with portal to x application or you want to add an application you can add it or you want to add a docker image and you want to run your own with parameters you can run it so this is just kind of seen as the next step in that process which we are really excited for didn't know if you had anything you wanted to add on top of that uh actually just a, a couple more ones that aren't in your development show notes right now uh that i hadn't put in there because i would totally forgotten about doing that uh, just going through what we have yeah. on on the the, the camboard uh, done column it. here to, to run through that. So the big one here is the collections 3.0. And this should have been done actually, I think, when we switched it over to to, to a collection from a role. Uh, I neglected to do that. Just I, I don't know what my thought process was at the time, but that clearly should have been a, a, a major version bump. Um, so I, I did make that change. So now the collection is version 3.0 and up and 2.x and below is going to be uh, the collection as a role. Now, there was also a difference in CICD that we implemented because of that. Um, we no longer have to mirror over to GitHub in order for it to be included in the Ansible collections uh, in Ansible Galaxy. Ansible Galaxy is now accepting a tarball for the collections. So it is simply pushing up the tarball that's generated in the CICD uh, when that gets tagged, actually, is, is how we're doing it. So right now we have a tag 3.0.10. Uh, and the only reason it's 10 instead of 2 is because 2 through 9 were me testing the CICD. So fair enough. Once, fair enough. Once okay. I once I got that fixed, uh, that that works like a charm here. Uh, it, we still do have our stable dash three branch though, so those those branches are still valid. Also, in the requirements.yaml, I mean, we still list it as a git git repo, right? So that means that you can check out simply the branch instead of having to manually check out the version. Uh, but you should see all of the the collection tarballs if you want to download it from uh, Galaxy instead of getting the Git repo from GitLab. Uh, you will be able to do that now as well. And it's going to be the same thing because it gets pushed up every time we tag uh, a release there. So that was a couple uh, of my tasks. 3.0.10. Kind of combined into one. Oh, yeah, CICD. Yeah, well, oh, CICD. I wish they hadn't architected it like they did, but they did. So what are you going to do? Fair enough. Uh, the other thing that we we did actually also with CI/CD is creating the commands receivable Docker container. Yeah. Uh, so we were talking about doing that. So now the CI/CD builds that every time again that we tag. Uh, also every time we push to master, it will build that that Docker container and push that up to Docker Hub. So now we have an updated collection and we have an updated Docker Hub uh, registry of the container so that should be a lot faster rather than having to build that over and over uh, now that does work offline uh if if you spin an instance up offline given that you have the appropriate stuff cached and and, and can run that right. but uh, yeah it's 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 up there and ready to go 
So, uh, and, and, you know, like, like Jack was saying, I mean, that's, that's, that's all tying into this idea that we're migrating a lot of the functionality that we had, uh, Rundeck doing, that we had the central command and control server executing is now going to be done locally on the box. We are definitely moving in a more self-hosted direction uh, in, in a contained infrastructure type of way. This is going to save us on, on bandwidth and operating costs totally. as well, too. Don't don't get me wrong. I mean, I'm totally doing this for a selfish reason. It just makes sense to do it this way because it's also an altruistic reason as well. So um, happy, happy with those those developments here and i will put those in the show notes as soon as i remember to do that actually as soon as you go over bitwarden uh, folders organization and send yeah so the the title of today's episode collect and send i meant to do collections and send but it's going to be collect and send collect your passwords put them in your groups manage them with your organizations send them to whoever you want <laughs> that's where it's at <laughs> So, covering three things today. Folders and search. Okay, that's that's one. Uh, organizations and send. Hopefully, you can take something away from this. I was definitely going through it, and I had no idea what send was until I went over it. So, if not anything, you can take something away from send. No, it's not via email. It's a link. Okay. <laughs> Getting into folders and search here. I really don't have much to say on these. It's the most... It's the easiest way to logically manage your passwords, identities, credit cards, what have you. I don't know how anyone could get along without using folders, honestly. If you're one of those people that just... I have 387 items in my vault. 387. Not... Like, that's almost 400 right there. If I didn't use folders, I would be absolutely lost. So... We can take a look at the upstream. Now, granted, I only have a handful of things, a handful of folders. It's like six, <laughs> and each item has like 20. So, yeah, there are a lot of floating around passwords out there. But folders are the essence of organization. They allow you to logically group items for, imagine this, organization. Essentially, the upstream documentation provides great documentation on this. I wasn't going to even do a justice on this documentation, so I linked directly to it. The one thing I love about Bitwarden, I think it just comes standard with most services. You can create unlimited subfolders as you want. So you can just keep nesting subfolders of passwords just getting deeper and deeper. Now, I'm one of those people that, you know, I have, like I said, my six folders, you know, home lab, like AWS, you know, like a hand, you know, personal emails, because I have guess what? More than one email account. And I just go, all right, need, you know, need this email password today or whatever, logging into this one. But within those, it basically the, breaks down your view into only viewing those items. So you're not looking at your root directory with who knows how many passwords in there, which if you ask me, makes it really nice because some of this stuff ends up being scoped. So like for my home lab, for an example, um, I do have passwords in there and sometimes it's just easier for me to, you know, instead of remembering a server name, going through and clicking uh, my home lab uh, folder and then going searching from there because it's already broken down rather than, all right, what was the name of that server again? What was the name of that application password I needed? And it's like, uh, you know, if, if I start to search for it, the search functionality is there, but Truthfully, if I don't know what I'm looking for, I'm never going to find it. Now, if it's scoped and I say it's in that in that folder, I'm going to have direct access to it right there. I'm going to be like, oh, all right, you know, I'm scrolling through 20 items instead of 400, uh, which just makes it a lot easier. The flip side of that I did want to point out is that if you're in a folder and start searching for something outside the folder... It will good, return nothing. Good luck. Which good is luck. confusing as all get out until you realize, oh, yeah, that's right. I'm, I'm in a folder. inside of a folder. Yeah. yeah. So it makes a – really, folders just make all vault items easy to find. If you don't have any kind of organization and you have a Bitwarden instance out there, first step I would take after setting up your account and you know maybe changing it to the theme to dark would be set up your folders because – it's so much easier 
to get organized first and go from there than it is to dump, you know, import all your passwords and go, all right, well, it's working, you know, it's working now because unfortunately what happens, and I have seen this with myself, is that you set up your instance, you import your passwords and you go, yes, it's working. And then you literally do not set up folders or you don't set up folders. You set them up for what you need. So you end up having a a bunch in that root directory and then you're just kind of stuck. I don't want to say in limbo, but you're basically having to recall from memory what account you actually need to look up. And now that's, that's pretty easy. If I I log on to city bank and I, I type in city, right. And it makes it even easier if I got the URI that matches up there and it just pops up in my browser. Sure. And that makes it even easier. Uh, where it gets confusing is when, like, how we keep the vault passwords in, in right, there. Right, right. We have many vault passwords in there, right? And and having to sift through the entirety of my vault, <clears throat> excuse me, having to sift through the entirety of my vault to find them it's uh, is tedious. A it's not terrible, yeah. but it's, it's, it's tedious. And it's worth it to to for me to create folders now it's a value proposition though i mean if you're not going to use it if you're simply going to use search and you're just using it for website logins i mean that that could work i mean there's no there's no reason that you have to create folders there's no reason that you have to you know put them even have multi-level folders right because i mean you could you could as well make the argument that you should change up your or you right should, you should subdivide your folders and, and and you don't even have to do that right uh, where it comes in handy though i'll tell you is understanding how that is split up so that you can split them up with organizations and collections absolutely and I'll let you go over absolutely that. Yeah. so the one thing i'll note here I'll just jump into organizations. Bitward and organizations add a layer of collaboration and sharing to password management for you know your family, your team, your enterprise. Uh, basically, allowing you to securely share common information like Office, you know, share any kind of password with a team is essentially what organizations are trying to get at. And it's a, you can do this securely. Is their big value prop? It's all right. You can share a password with your team if you're both on Bitwarden. And Andrew and I end up doing this for. Composition enterprises, you know, we he just mentioned it. We have all of our, our vault passwords, our our composed bot passwords, and some of the passwords out there for shared logons. Um, now, collections. So that at a very high brief level, th- that's what an, or- an organization is basically an item in Bitwarden. I'll say that connects two identities and then allows them to share passwords. So within organizations you get collections and collections are similar to folders in that they provide a way to logically group items for your organization. Again, I'm, I'll say it, the pointing to right to the Bitwarden upstream, uh, they have great documentation for collections and how they work. Uh, but they have this great quote that I pulled. It's think of collections as organization equivalents to the folders used to organize a personal vault with a few key differences. And this is really kind of where the important part is. Organizations control access to organization-owned items by assigning users or groups to collections. Organization-owned items must be included in at least one collection. So everything, every item collected under under an organization has to belong to a collection. And if you sign in and you're used to Bitwarden and you have an organization already out there, you may notice when you sign into your instance, you're actually going to see, I believe it's all items, uh, trash. You're going to see types, which gives you, you know, login card, identity, secure note. You're going to see your folders and then you're going to see organization collections. So for my personal, so I do run a personal Bitwarden. Um, I do not have collections just because I'm solo user on there. Uh, it's just me. Uh, but for this, uh, we when I log into our compositional enterprises, because I don't, you know, I'm not going to keep my personal password. I'm I'm not going to hold. Uh, what was I going? Where was I going with this? I, I'm not going to hold all my per all my personal on an organization account, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. Essentially, when I log in, I don't have full. Fo- I have the screenshot up there. I don't know if you can see it. I don't have folders set up in my I'll, I'll say our organization account 
I have collect. If you look, I have all the collections. Correct. I blacked Correct. out all our collections yeah. just because, you know, mm-hmm. didn't want to give anyone any, any ideas. Uh, I think Andrew mentioned the one, the vault pass, uh, or yeah, the vault pass for in- environment instances, uh, which we are, are ours and that we maintain. So our compositional enterprises vault mm-hmm. pass in case, in case we'd have to go through an update, any kind of environment variable, maybe a rails key, uh, development key or production key. Um, but I thought I'd get you with that one. Uh, but within the organization, uh, you you have that ability to create a collection and then create passwords and share those passwords. And the one thing I'll note here that I did see between uh, Vault Warden and Bitwarden, uh, kind of a small item here, is that organization passwords, you can share them and they show up as a shared icon. I think on the upstream Bitwarden, it shows as... They have a different icon. It shows. So I have a picture. Mm-hmm. You know our podcast for being the pictures, pictures and uh, graphs podcasts. Um, but I have in our book sack documentation. If you guys want to go out and take a look, essentially it shows uh, the shared button. And on the upstream, I think it has maybe like a square or something uh, to mm-hmm. notify that it sh- to note to kind of notify you and recognize and like you know help you to know that hey this is an organizational account it shows up just as a different icon something very small Uh, along those same lines in compositional enterprise instances easy 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 to share with an organization essentially you click on your password you click the setting you click the little settings button next to the password and you hit share and you can just share it directly to an organization makes it very easy so now the one thing i did want to note is that when you share something with an organization as if I shared it with you. Yeah. When I, when I, well, when I, when I shared it with the organization, sure. you being part of the organization, sure. it shows up in your vault as an entry. Correct. So there are reasons why the folders and the collections are split out. Right. Absolutely. Because if you go into all items you, and you, you look at all your items, you could, you're going to see your personal stuff as well as your shared stuff. And right. that's where when Jack creates his keys and doesn't share them with the organization, it's not immediately apparent because that it's they're not, in his right. general vault. Right. Right. That it actually requires him to go in and share it once with the organization. And then once he does, it shows up in my vault as a native entry. Right. It, 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 as we were talking about, it does have that shared icon to indicate that it's been shared, but it does show up in my all items. It's not like they're segmented out. Uh, when you look at all the items, I can have my personal items it's, living it's side by side with my shared at that items. root directory, yeah. littered with both. So, uh, that's where at least having some kind of folder and collection structure comes into play because then you can say, at least let me separate out into folders, you know, mine and then the collections into someone else's. Right. Right. That, that is going to be the easiest way to do it. And, and even when I get shared an item, I can, it can be in a collection and I can also put it in a folder of mine. Right. So I, I have a folder that's automatically created called no folder. Uh, and everything that I haven't put into a folder gets shared into that no folder folder, which is confusing. But hear me out. The, the entries that are, are shared with me by Jack get put in my vault. Right. And, and my vault, everything is in a folder in my vault, whether it's in a collection or not. It's going to be in a folder, right? Either it's going to be like in, in this uncategorized, no folder, you know, not not put into a folder yet. Um, or it's going to be something that I put into one of my other folders. And that's that's how this, this works. It's almost like this four-dimensional uh, organizational structure that, that Bitmorden has to have set up in order to incorporate the ability to organize passwords personally that have been shared within the organization so you can not only have a password shared in an organization be in this organization collection but you would also be able to 
to categorize it yourself using your folder system. Right. So I can have the same password in like my R Composebot folder because I have a personal R Composebot folder that every time Jack creates R Composebot somewhere else it's... and shares the password with me, I put it in that folder and he has already also put it in, in the that collection. R Composebot collection. Correct. Right. So I I can see those entries two different places. The way I manage it in my folders that only affect me personally or in the collections that affect both of us and how we both see it. So even if I put something in an R Composebot collection and, and say it's not an R Composebot thing, right? Yeah. Jack can Move choose it. to put that wherever he wants right. in his own his own personal folders. He can put it in whatever personal folder he wants. But he's going to put it – it's going to be in that collection when it shows up for him. Obviously, he can move it around to different collections or whatnot. But the collection that it comes in does not dictate the folder. The folders are always going to be personal, and the collections are what's shared. So I I, I just kind of wanted to, it's to talk thin, about yeah. that because yeah. that, was, that was the big thing that got me when you and I first started sharing passwords. I would put it in the collection – and not even realize that it, it was could be moved. just getting thrown yeah. anywhere in your yeah. personal setting. I yeah. was like, well, go to the folder. And you're like, it's not there. I'm like, how? it's in my folder. Why is it in your, your folder? Your folders are personal. Like, right. Right. Exa- my folder is personal. Right. So that's the big thing. To no- that's the key thing to note. You take away one thing besides send is a link and not an email. You take away that collections are for organizations and folders are for individual users. Correct. Yeah. I'd, I'd go with that. And speaking of send, what is send? Mind blowing. <laughs> it is really okay. How does um, this work then? All right, send is a secure and ephemeral way to transmit sensitive information to anyone. Boom! Mind blowing. Love this. Love I it. immediately thought it was going to be like link an SMTP server. I was like, oh, <laughs> killing me. Uh, but <laughs> no, it's awesome because you can just email the link to someone and say, Hey, yo, check this link out. I got it. I got my secure note up on the, uh, on my Bitwarden instance, but sends can include plain text or file attachments up to 500 meg, half a gig. That's a lot of, that's, that's a lot. If you ask me or a hundred, if you're creating it from mobile and every send is assigned a randomly generated and secure link, which can be shared with anyone. So really, that's the key thing you're taking away. You can upload file or text, and you can create it. It generates some random link. You send the link to someone, and bada bing, bada boom, some magic goes on, and there is a a link that is can have an expiration date, can have a deletion date. You basically share this thing. It can be viewed one time. Um, you create it, and... Essentially, you can send it to anyone to to send that secure note to them. Yeah, it's it's what we were talking about before. I mean, in wherever your community resides, right. right? Whether that's in Slack, whether that's in Discord, whether that's in Matrix, I don't care. You can share a link with people. That right. is fundamentally how the internet works. So this is going to be easy, whether it's going to be email or not. Yeah, you're sharing that secure note, and th- I want to make make a note of this. Every send is has three things and is three things. It's end-to-end encrypted, it's dynamically ephemeral, and it's customizably private. I wonder if you could print out QR codes for these. If you could generate and print out QR codes for these and like Whoa, stick them different the places in the city. The link. Yeah. And, you can and generate you could, a QR could, code from the link and the link could just link to yeah. this. So. Yeah, absolutely. And you have like a so so you like said it also has like a one time use kind of. I believe it does. It's uh, okay. Yeah, maximum ac- maximum access count. Okay. Oh, even nicer. So you could so have like the first ten third, people to yeah, see this right, right. QR code get access to the. Oh, that's awesome. Right, right. That's awesome. So and then you can add a password to it as well. So a lot of awesome features with this, but. I'm telling you, I really thought uh, when I initially opened this, it was going to lead me to an email link and ask me to configure SMTP. So I'm glad I explored this one. Um, it just generates a link for you dynamically, kind of on the fly, uh, does some encryption with it, and then says, hey, you know, you want to send this link to somebody, and this is the data that you want to send. Here's your link, and if you need a password on it, here you go. If you need it to expire, here you go. And if you need them to access it only one time, we can do that. 
So a, now, lot, a lot of cool features with it. To be fair, to be fair, Nextcloud does do a very similar thing with files. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and that's going to be more useful for when it for comes file sharing to, absolutely yeah for file, for file sharing, sharing for any absolutely. kind of public gallery uh access uh anything like that that's going to be a lot more useful i would i would definitely recommend if if send is going to be your main use case for bitwarden rather than sorting passwords i would recommend against it yeah absolutely it's gonna be okay it's gonna be a little bit lighter weight than next cloud but man can you do so much more with next cloud yeah um, Absolutely, but this is this is really cool though. This this is cool to know that it's built in and available to us here. Yeah, and you know what? One real quick thing before I wrap up on send. It's a great feature. Uh, the one thing I noticed is that that's a bit odd or kind of threw me off a bit. Is you can't directly share a password if that makes sense. So when I when I saw send, I was immediately thinking, all right, I'm gonna create a test item in my vault and I want to hit send to this. Uh, and you know. And, I'm going to share this link with someone to a password. It actually will not let you do that. It's almost strictly for text. So if you want to copy a password and send it to somebody or share it as a link, you're going to have to actually kind of, this is how I would do it. Open up two tabs. You're going to click one for send and one for your vault item. You're going to open the item, the vault item. You're going to copy your password. Then you're going to open that send page up, you know, set your parameters and input that password. If you wanted to share it with someone, you know, maybe set the access count to one, Uh, just kind of the one kind of, quirky or odd thing i found just i was expecting to be able to share passwords from collections or passwords from wherever and maybe it's good that they don't allow you to do it by default just for security's sake but just kind of something i thought would be a cool feature to have in there yeah you don't want someone to accidentally hit the wrong button and share all of your passwords so i i could no no but you know just sharing one even but yeah yeah yeah. I get it. I yeah. get it. So there's definitely security stance for it. Have you tried doing this from the add-on or from the mobile version? I have not. No, I, okay. I just created it in the um, uh, web, the web UI there. Well, sounds like something I should include on my next video. I agree. I, 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 yeah, I think Send is available on both. Obviously, it's on mobile. And then it is here in the web add-on, but... I have not explored either of those. I just introduced to it, honestly, um, when I was looking yeah, so into it. I thought it was email, but yeah. Yeah, so if, if you're interested in, in how Send works, I will be exploring that, I, 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 I guess. I mean, that's that's the next logical thing for me to, to dive into in depth and, and say, all right, this is this is how Send works. So that's going to go up on our YouTube channel. Uh, you can find us, look for our Compose. Uh, we have all our intro videos. Yeah. We have all these podcasts actually up there as well. So if YouTube is more convenient for you, I don't know why, because RSS is just about as convenient as it gets. But if YouTube for some reason is more convenient for you, we also post these podcasts up there uh, as well as all of the integration session yeah. videos that we do. Yep. Absolutely. Go check those out. But that's all I had for this week. I didn't know if you had anything else you wanted to add or if you want to jump into some scrum ban here. Yeah, go ahead and give me a good uh, segue. So a good segue. I feel like we've been on our segues tonight. Andrew is going to dive into it. No, I'm just joking. Uh, <laughs> uh, we've been riding our segues through this podcast. We have, you know what? We haven't said dive in yet this episode. So, oh yeah, we have. Oh, have we totally we? have. I, I guarantee we have. I haven't. I, we don't get through. We don't get through the first a, five minutes a, without saying the first dive. Five minutes without diving into something. Um, no. Okay. <laughs> uh, so that was send, and I think now Andrew's going to send us right into our grab bag here with Scrum Ban. Absolutely. So I, I wanted to ask the question, what is Scrum Ban? I have just a ton of notes uh, here. So I'm going to I'm gonna walk through, I think, most of these. I do want to get to the very end because that's kind of where all of this comes together. I was going to ask here, where would you put us if, if this was a, um, I don't want to say a book, uh, a series, I'd say, on our can board, Scrum, Kanban uh, journey or episode here. I know we've covered the last, I think two or three episodes now on uh, scrum Kanban and all those topics I just mentioned, where would you put us at? Would you say this is tying them all together or would you say 
where would you put this? Kind of right in the middle? I think my biggest takeaway from this is the ways in which Scrum and Kanban are viscerally different and can complement each other using those differences. Definitely. So having gone over Kanban, having gone over Scrum, I think we're poised perfectly to dive into what Kanban or what Scrum Band, excuse me, is and and how really that defines itself opposed to both Scrum and, and Kanban. Now, the term Scrum Band was originally coined by Corey Laid- Laidas, L- Ladas in his 2008 paper Scrum Band and expanded on in his similarly titled book in 2009 scrum band the original goal of this methodology was to use kanban to improve scrum so if you take a look at the timeline the typical timeline would go introduce scrum implement kanban features on top of scrum get to level two scrum band and then transition completely into kanban so that's that's the the thought of of how this would go uh, and and we'll back up as well. Scrum Band, uh, what is Scrum Band? Scrum Band is a hybrid of Scrum and Kanban, if you haven't gotten that already. The term, or uh, it combines the project management and product delivery focus of Scrum with the pull systems, workflow visualization, and process improvement of Kanban. Those are the main differences. And the next, like, 15 minutes, you're going to see those spelled out over and over again. So I really uh, am am going to be driving those home uh, in order for us to see how they work together. So if we start with the idea of Scrum, what are the problems that needed to be solved? Uh, The first one is that the rules of Scrum are not always enough to help team members get past their particular challenges. That was a big trend that came out. The... Uh, the other problems were there were too many new ideas coming into the product backlog. The the pre-backlog even kept growing without any kind of resolution. And almost as a direct result, uh, as certainly a consequence, um, the product owners appeared to be performing insufficiently well. Uh, frequently, they were being rotated out of their positions. Um, they were delegating or splitting the responsibility that should have been s- a sole product owners, or they were being replaced by committees, which is even worse. So to recap Scrum and Kanban, and like I said, we're going to do this several times over the episode. Scrum is a product development framework. We are developing products with this. There are three main roles in Scrum. That's what makes it Scrum. There's a product owner, there's a Scrum master, and there's a team member. Uh, yeah, generally more than one team member. Uh, Scrum uses a story format to describe its units of work. As a type of user, I want to specific action so that I can have a result. Right. And a lot of a lot of stories fall into that that template. Um, Scrum also enforces time boxed iterations, uh, where you iterate not only over the product that you're making, but the process behind how you're making the product itself. Um, so your Scrum primarily is made up of those roles, the story format, and the time box iterations. Kanban, alternatively, is a method for changing and improving a team's process. The first thing you do is you start with what you're doing now, and you evolve it using small incremental changes based on experimentation and data. Uh, next, uh, and I think probably the most important part of Kanban, is to set work in progress limits for each stage in the process. This detects when the workflow is overloaded uh, and av- affords the ability to make adjustments to address the constraints that are the root cause of that overload. Uh, and then as a direct result of that, you can you will, uh, in, in essence, establish a pull system based on Kanban signals. Uh, so uh, that leads us to team self-organizing around available cycles and self-assigning tasks. Uh, and, and a very good quote here I pulled uh, from the paper, and this is actually from a Gardner uh, paper uh, wrapping up Scrum Band. I'll, I'll have to link it um, in, in the show notes here. But uh, a good quote that they pulled was, 
quote, just as an unregulated index card on a cork board is not a can van, time boxed iteration planning is not a pull system. So we are we are talking about very loose systems here, but they still have, you know, a minimum set of rules and requirements here, right? So uh, that's that's having gone over Scrum and Kanban and, and highlighting the differences between the two. So what actually changes if you implement Scrum Band though? Like like what what are the actual changes that you're making with Scrum Band? Yeah. Right. Uh, so I think this broke it down most effectively when it said team members use Kanban uh, systems thinking to analyze and understand their workflows. And here we start talking about optimizing flow, right? Uh, and and how are we doing that? Well, we're doing that with Kanban's visualization tools. Uh, those tools provide transparency that expose bottlenecks, cues, variability, and waste. Uh, so Kanban, once again, is coming in on top of Scrum, Scrum being this uber rigid process and Kanban looking at systems thinking and yeah. say, where does the system start? Where does the system end? Right. And let's represent that fully and completely. Right. So you are now visualizing the entire system and, and you're getting that transparency and, and you're able to see those bottlenecks. Right. And the tools in place to do that um, are their metrics. Right. So the metrics can expose where the system is overloaded but the team has not discovered the source of the problem, right? So you're looking at the symptoms uh, in order to diagnose the cause. Uh, there are four that I highlighted here that I think Kanban uh, gets right. So I think the first one is lead time, and that's going to be the concept to cache. It's going to be the complete systems thinking. That's going to be when does the idea happen, occur, and when does when do we get paid, when when is it done? When is the product delivered? Right, Wh whatever that product ends up being. When is when is done fulfilled? Uh, the next is cycle time, which is actually uh, the hands-on keyboard part of it. Or uh, when is the actual work performed, and how long does that work actually take? Right. So uh, that's going to be different from how do I uh, come up with an idea. Uh, how do I define the idea? How do right. I prioritize the idea? None of that is involved in cycle time. Cycle time is after all of that, after we've defined it, after we prioritized it, we say, okay, we are starting to work on it now. And that's when the cycle time starts and it ends when the actual work is done. Now they're, uh, you know, given different feedback loops and stuff, you could you could ship it out to QA or you could ship it out and say, hey, let's have a user accept acceptance test, right? You know, it, it, here's, here's this, uh, what's the feedback on it? And that's going to be outside of cycle time because we've already done the work and, and the work is simply being tested at that point. If it needs to be worked on further, that will also count to... Uh, count into into cycle time but cycle time is the actual time that it takes the team members to work on the task where the lead time is the perspective of the end user uh, of the client from their idea to when they receive that idea uh, those are the two cycles that you're going to see most talked about uh, in in Kanban, uh, I think the other two are not talked about as much, but are as important. Uh, so the first one is going to be the WIP limit. So that's going to be the work in progress limits, and and I would call that a metric in itself because you know that could dictate a a, a lot of things, right? How consistent are your tasks, right? Are you are you able to set a good WIP limit, or are your WIP limits varied too much to actually set a good WIP limit? Right. What is your task count? You know, or are you basing it on complexity where you're able to vary the, the size of your work uh, to to a slight degree? Um, are you using story points, which also take into account the value, like the business value uh, of that task? And are you doing any kind of time tracking? Because cycle time, hands on keyboard time right. is time that your developers are putting into this. Are you doing any time tracking? Are you doing whip limits based on time tracking? Are you doing 40 hour a week whip limits? Like is, is that a thing you're doing? Who knows? Right. So these are all possibilities that you can 
limit um, because whip limiting is just saying I'm working on this amount of thing in this amount of time. All right. Uh, and that is, that is going to be different for different organizations. Once again, this is more of a conceptual idea. This isn't any kind of prescriptive uh, metric here. And the last metric is going to be throughput. Uh, and that is the amount of whip that gets completed in a given time. Um, and you can look up Little's Law. I'm not going to dive into that right now, but Little's Law kind of shows you, gives you an estimation of how much work is going to be done uh, based on your whip limits and your throughput, right? Uh, I'm sorry, your throughput and your cycle time, right? Um, so how long you're actually uh, hands-on keyboard, yeah. right? And what your throughput is, like how how much of your whip limit are you getting done? If your whip limit is by task count, how many tasks are you getting done? If your whip limit is by complexity, how much complexity are you getting done per whatever, right? So you start looking over that. That's where you start seeing these second level improvements. You see where are these improvements over time? Is my automation reducing my uh, my cycle time or is it improving my throughput, right? What is the reality of my performance? How much can I actually budget for a week? You know, when I say to some, when I say that I'm going to get something done in three weeks, can't do I realistically have two other weeks to, uh, worth of work right, ahead of me, right. or do I have four? And then that's that's going to to bump that other task back. Um, stability of work throw. Am I getting the same amount of work done per week or am I declining? Am I improving? How is that going? Uh, and, and at the end of that, af after analyzing that, after making little tweaks and doing incremental improvements based on experimentation and data, hopefully getting to a predictable process. And that throughput is your measure of predictability. All of this to say that if the product owner can show the stakeholders that these new rules can lead to faster or more predictable development and lower lead times, stakeholders will be happy to accept their decisions. Uh, the decisions that they made to make, though, um, which we're going to talk about next in better backlog management. Alternatively, if the lead times do not decrease, right, if I'm not seeing that my features are getting to me faster, then the experiment could be perceived as an hindrance rather than right. a boon. So the clients are seeing this as a hindrance rather than a boon. Remember, these metrics are only useful if they translate into a perceived faster development turnaround. If they do, then you have a product owner who is empowered to manage your backlog better. They are empowered basically to say no. A perfect example of an ever-growing product backlog issue can be found in the YouTube video Agile Product Ownership in a Nutshell. That is a very, very good YouTube video. I had several revelations after watching it. It was just a really good way to conceptualize um, how a backlog can function in a healthy manner, right? Because you, you don't want a backlog that is ever-growing. So an, a very easy fix for a feeling of being overloaded and facing increasing pressure to multitask and cut corners is to visualize where the work is piling up. Sure. Adding a pre-backlog quote-unquote feature request columns will expose that more feature requests are coming in than can be handled by the team. That's kind of a this scary a thought problem. right there. It's a very scary thought because I can have as many ideas as, as you I want. have seconds in the day, right. right? This is a problem that can be addressed at a product owner level saying no to additional work to meet the constraints of this new column. Adjusting the whip limit up or down on experience will help to find the optimal limit that leads to the lowest average lead time per story. As well, I also think having a rejected column is optional if it helps to communicate to stakeholders better when, when it's visualized. Sure. sure. When you're able to say, hey, look, this has been rejected. You, you know, we're, we're rejecting this, right? It's not that I didn't value it because the worst thing you could do is say, I am immediately discarding your idea, right? right? The being able to throw it in reject and say, Hey, I value your idea. I'm documenting it. I think it was very well thought out. I'm very glad you brought this up to it. And we have put in the effort to make a decision and determination on it and determined it to be rejected at this time. And it's, it's in there. Uh, that treats everyone with respect and it moves the system forward by not clogging up the backlog. This is also known as level two scrum ban. 
um, from the article, once you've broken up the time box, you can start to get leaner about the construction of the backlog. Uh, agility, you know, being agile, what we're talking about here, implies the ability to respond to demand. The backlog should reflect the current understanding of business circumstances as often as possible. In other words, a backlog should be event-driven. Time boxing uh, is, is just that, where the event is a timer, and once we see it that way, we can imagine other sorts of events that allow us to respond more quickly to emerging priorities. So since our system already demonstrates pull and flow, that increased responsiveness should come at no cost to our current efficiency. Once we see this as a, a system, a systems thinking, once we apply systems thinking from concept to cash, from beginning to end, we can start saying, all right, where is, where is it not optimal? Where is it not optimized? And start looking at how do we increase that responsiveness in those locations? Let me pause for a drink here. Any questions before I ramble on? No, I do not have any right now. I'm going to have to check out that YouTube video. Though, I'll tell you that. I want to check that good. out. Yeah, no, I yeah. would I would definitely recommend that. Um, I was actually talking about going over that on the last episode, uh, but I think this article pulled it together far better than, than I could have uh, using that video. Okay. Absolutely. So we've gone over... Uh, what scrum band what what the definition of scrum band is you know a hybrid of of scrum and kanban are the problems that we need to solve kind of defining our end to end workflow and the problem of too many new ideas not having a good enough project manager uh and 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 really kind of feeling this pressure that we we don't visualize with existing tooling right we've gone over what scrum is this kind of time boxed with the roles the scrum story format we've gone over kanban with its uh whip limits and its pull system and it's it's what reflects reality and what changes uh, when we put Kanban on top of Scrum? You know, we're, we're optimizing our flow from end to end, and we're doing better backlog management by visualizing that entire workflow. So coming into some common misconceptions about Scrum Band is where I think this all kind of gets pulled together. Scrum Band here, uh, one of the misconceptions goes, is simply a tool to organize work and to make it more efficient, right? <laughs> so... To go over the very first definition of Scrum that we, we threw out here, Scrum is a focused on project management and product delivery. Kanban is focused on process improvement, right? Kanban is an end-to-end -end process that we analyze. Scrum is getting that product out the door. If Scrum Band is adopted because the team is overloaded, it is likely to succeed in changing the way the team works, but unlikely to fix the problems that cause the overload, right? So what we need to do is we need to move on to that level two scrum ban and we need to implement that pull system that steps outside of the time box to say we need to know when we have available cycles. And you go, you walk up to anyone in IT, they're going to say, oh, yeah, I'll get to it when I have, you know, a free cycle. Yeah, absolutely. What do you mean? I actually emailed one of my, my coworkers like the first like month I was in my, my new job. I was like, what do you mean cycle? He's like. Just kind of, you know, when I got time, I'm like, so you're just throwing out this term that you have an inherent idea about, yeah. but you don't haven't actually, you know, figured out what you mean, right? Better. You haven't right. been able to, to, to flesh it out completely. And, and this is doing that. It's like, what is your cycle? Well, your cycle is your pull system. It's when the next thing in your process can get started on. Can move over. Right. Can move over. Exactly. Uh, and then after the evolution stops, right, go, coming back to Scrum Band being a tool to organize work, after evolution stops, the team is no longer following Kanban or any other method for improvement, right? Kanban is continually improving. Uh, so uh, in in summation, Scrum Band is, is not simply a tool to organize work and make it more efficient. Um, the other misconception here is that Scrum Band is essentially iterationless Scrum. Uh, Scrum teams are attracted to the idea of Scrum Band because it, because it provides a convenient excuse to remove the hard part. Uh, iteration is not just a way to break projects into phases. It is a tool for accountability, and that accountability can be uncomfortable. Uh, this is one of the most important features of Scrum because it helps teams make decisions based on experience and actual known facts from their projects. Yeah. Uh, so 
there are several things that need to happen with or without iterations. Uh, one, team demonst- teams need to demonstrate work in software. Two, stakeholders need to refine their requirements. And that that's like testing out. Once once you get some delivered, they need to, to refine it. They also need to work in the beginning to refine it and scope it out. Three, teams need to review their process obstacles, right. how their process is failing them and how to improve it. Four, teams need to agree on process improvements. Five, sure. teams need to agree on what work to prioritize. This all has to happen. Right. In Scrum, iterations are the way to do that. It's just that that is time boxed. And there, if we think of, you know, going back, if we think of time as just simply an event, right? If the event is the timer, uh, we can imagine other sorts of events, not a timer, that allow us to respond more quickly to emerging priorities. That's what this pull system allows us for. It allows us to be more agile in that manner. So how to replace iterations? Well, an effective Scrum ban implementation must include practices that provide the empirical process control benefits of iterations. Let me repeat that because one, that was a lot of big words. And two, that was the most important sentence that I have said today. It must include practices that provide the empirical process control benefits of iterations to break that down. It needs to include practices that provide the planning aspect of iterations. It needs to include practices that provide the predictability benefits of iterations. The same for the accountability benefits of iterations and the ceremonies for reflection benefit of iterations. You have to have all of those processes in place. You have to be able to plan stuff. You have to be able to say, predict stuff. You have to be able to hold other people accountable and you have to reflect on what got completed. Cadences, right, as these are known in the Kanban world, are triggered by milestones or external events rather than a time box iteration. Each work item can be considered part of the reflection process, and no work item is considered complete until it's been included in a retrospective, talking about ceremonies for reflection. And as well, I can go on about work items, you know, no work item can be considered prioritized until it's been moved out of the analysis phase. Right. Whether that is uh, idea ingest or scoping or prioritization, right? That all has to happen. And that is actually probably even not a bad way to start your board saying idea ingest, you know, uh, definition, right? Or, or scoping and then prioritization. If those three things easy don't happen, and you have easy way one, to start it. one massive backlog and you just say, I'm just going to throw every idea you have here. You're going to have ideas in all kinds of states and you, all kinds of different priorities. You know what's going to happen every single time you have an idea. You're going to want to skip that backlog because you don't have a defined process, right? You're just going to want to say, ah, I'm just going to drag that into working on right. it right now because I, I, it's immediately in my mind. Right. And that is not right, the right way to do it in 90% of the cases. In that 10% of emergencies, absolutely. Fine. And that's what the pool system allows for. That's why you have an emergency swim lane, right? The ability to re- react in an agile manner to these emergencies is inbuilt into these types of systems. But these types of systems also include having that planning uh, process, having that predictability, having that accountability, and having those ceremonies for reflection, right? If, if you don't have those, then it's just Nonsense. a note on a cork board. Right. It's chaos. And and we're trying to get to the opposite of chaos. <laughs> so coming coming down the final stretch here, how do you implement process improvement? Because we've hammered over and over again, right? Scrum is going to be the thing that actually provides you the product. Kanban is going to be that iterative process improvement right. to the process. Right. Yeah, exactly. So step one, and this is broken up in two steps. So step one, start with what you do now. Agree to pursue incremental evolutionary change. And initially, respect current roles, responsibilities, and job titles. 
And I think we harped on this in the last episode or, or the episode before, but if your board doesn't reflect reality, it's nonsense. You're living a fantasy. Right. It, it's not helping anybody. So start with what you do now. Start with the process you do now. Maybe it maybe you don't prioritize your backlog. Maybe you don't uh, you know scope out your ideas. Maybe everything just gets thrown into there, right? But when you agree to pursue incremental evolutionary change, then you start looking at the stuff that's in step two of this how to implement process improvement, right? You visualize your workflow. And when you have a major backlog and you say, well, this workflow is backlog immediately to in progress. Is there, is there anything that we do in between there? Do we just respond to every email and every ping immediately with the complete output of the work? Because I, I wish. very much doubt that is the case. I very much doubt I that wish I had case. all those answers. First of all, <laughs> I'm getting way too many emails <laughs> yeah. way too often to be able to work on all of them and complete them before the next one comes in. Right. So don't lie to yourself. Is there a process in there? that you're that you're already doing or or you know that you're sometimes doing right and right. and then have that discussion are we going to pursue that incremental evolutionary change and that is also brought out by limiting whip if you have those in progress limits and you say hey i have a lot of my backlog let me split up my backlog and i can throw all my ideas in something that doesn't have whip but i'm going to limit the ideas that i prioritize to this many yeah and then, you know, if if I get pinged to add something, I'm going to say, hey, look, I'm full up yeah. for, for, for all these. I'm, I'm full. Up. What do you want me to deprioritize? Right. Exactly. Because I cannot prioritize that. If everything is prioritized, nothing, nothing is, is prioritized. Yeah, right. So that gives you a jumping off point to have those conversations. Uh, the third one, managing flow. And that is that is actually not a whole lot different than limiting whip. I mean, that is looking at your flow and saying, where's the whip building up? What's going on? Right? Where am I hitting my limits? Where is stuff getting stuck? And can I improve it at all? Um, making process policies explicit. How do I get something prioritized? You know, how do I get something scoped out? Like you and I have that, you know, why done how. Right. Right. We right. say, you know, why are we doing this? What is considered done? And how? How am I going yeah. to take a first crack at this? So making those those process policies, if if I cannot prioritize something until all three of those fields filled out, that is a policy that takes me from one column to the next. And I can point to that and I can say this card is in this column because it hasn't had that done yet. Right. Simple as that. As simple as that. And everyone knows and everyone That's is why. on the same page. Right. right. And at that point, your board starts reflecting reality. Now, once again, we've already agreed to pursue incremental evolutionary change. Right. Uh, we start looking then at that point uh, at the current roles, responsibilities and job titles. And we say, what about this can change in an incremental evolutionary type of way right working on these feedback loops and saying what are the obstacles i need to overcome in our process right how, how are we going to have how are we going to better our metrics how are we going to get a better lead time right a, a lower lead time how are we going to improve the perception that we're delivering product faster Right. And, and, and right. hopefully better right. as well. Right. What's our throughput look like? You know, what's our what's our cycle time and uh, what's our what's our whip limit look like? Right. And, and starting to unearth the roots of those problems. And then we improve collaboratively and evolve experimentally. Looking once again at those those roles, responsibilities and, and job titles, you know, Scrum is not wrong. In the sense of, of its roles, I, I do think, um, contrary actually to what you were talking about previously, I think having a, a good product owner is important. I also think having someone who can step up as Scrum Master, maybe right. someone who's who's a member of the team, but someone who's, who's tasked with looking at improving uh, 
collaboratively yeah. and evolving experimentally. You know, someone someone, someone who's, dedicated who's to that role to doing that. Right. That's that's a thing that a product manager should not be managing uh, or, or product owner should not be managing. And, and my big takeaway here is that I think Scrum gets the roles right. Because it splits up a manager. And and what is a manager? Someone who manages a team and someone who manages work coming into the team, right? Those are two things inherent in any kind of manager in the corporate field today. And I think they got that wrong, right? I think there needs to be two minds. And I think, you know, they both need to be juggling, working among the team, right? Doing, doing, managing the work that's among the team and managing the work that comes into the team. Right. I think that's two separate roles. And if you're a single manager, it almost sounds like I'm saying a single parent, but if you're, if you're a single manager and, and that's just your lot in life, then keep in mind that these are both your responsibilities. You cannot simply ignore one for the other. Right. You cannot you simply have to do say, both. my team can work the work that I, I that I bring them or that I prioritize for them. No, they need care and feeding like any other adult human being, right? People need to, to work collaboratively and that doesn't happen if you just ignore them. You know, part of self-organizing does not mean you just let them go to the wolves and let them do whatever you want, right? The care and feeding of your employees is, is one, managing the work that comes into them and then two, managing how they how the how the work gets uh, gets worked inside of the process right. that you have built up, right? So I I think Scrum Ban as a as a concept lays out some pretty good gr- ground rules, right? And takes the best of both both worlds, right? And and you and I, right? We've we've implemented iterative processes, right? We take a look at our process improvement, right? We take a look at our predictability. I mean, every every week, every other week, yeah. We take a look at our completed complexity. We say, here's our whip limit, right? Here's where we base our whip on, and that's that's our complexity, right? It's not a task count, but it's a it's a complexity count, right? And what's our throughput? of our whip limit, right? And that's directly related to Little's law and says how what's your how much velocity, are we going to get done basically. Right, right. Yeah, exactly. How much work are you going to get done? Uh, and then we have those for accountabilities and we have those ceremonies for reflection as well. Right. Um, for us that does happen to be time box inside of a pull system though. If you think about it, what we're doing is we keep replenishing and yeah, we could just individually keep a running tally of 10 complexity ready for us. Sure. Right. We could, if, if we were perfect human beings, turns out we're not. And we need little hints to say, Hey, keep in mind, you got to get this much work done this week. Right. 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 It's a very good visual indicator for us. So it's something that we've adopted that, that helps us work. And we hold each other accountable by sitting down, you know, once a week to go over stuff, actually twice a week now, since we have the podcast and the, the pair Pair programming. Yeah. So we're, we're, we're continuing to improve on those cycles. We're continuing to up our game and, you know, continuing to, to improve on the process that we have here. Right. And, you know, I, I've said it before and I'll say it again. I mean, I firmly believe that the further and further we get into this, this new world that we're running into, you know, we're, we're, we're people are. People are working two jobs, right? Where we have to manage communities, right? Where we, we we're juggling just so much on our plates. We don't only have to do more with what we have. We're going to be having to do more with less. And right. and yes, I mean less time to touch on everything that we need to keep up with, right? And the only way you're going to do that is by organizing yourself somehow, some way, right? Taking responsibility for your actions, right? Jumpstarting productivity, right? This is something we care about, right? We're going to be rehashing this over and over again, right? We're going to keep going through what does productivity mean, right? What does it mean to look at something and 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 deliver work to someone, right? What does it mean to bring value to someone, right? So if you want to share in that journey, the easiest way to do that is go to rcompose.com 
and subscribe to the mailing list. You're going to get all the heads up about these episodes. Uh, you're going to even know what we're talking about too. So if you want to skip the intro and skip the, the main integration session and jump right into the, the cool scrum band stuff, by all means do it, right? Uh, you're going to get a heads up about that, any YouTube videos and anything else we send out. Um, so that's where we live uh, right now in our email list. That's that's our community. Uh, also, our community is on Reddit. Go to reddit.com slash r slash rcompose. That's where you're going to find us. That's where we post stuff as well. Uh, so if you're more inclined to do that, we're, we're on there also. Um, and like we just released our new 3.0 update. This is big for us. This is very big, right? So this is something that we're going to start pushing more. We're close to the end of Q3. Yeah. Right, we're getting we're getting into the the final stretch. You know, last month of Q three, and our goal here is to have a a solid deliverable. You know that that we can we can demo that 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 we're going to be holding live demos, and and who knows what Q four is going to come out with. So you're going to want to stay up to date. Absolutely, do that. Follow us wherever we are, wherever is comfortable for you. Go to arcompose.com. That's going to be your springboard. And we hope that we can stay in touch with you. And with that, we hope that you enjoyed this episode of our Composecast. Thank you, be safe, and we'll see you all in two weeks. Goodbye, everybody.